Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar for CISTNI. Tonight we will be covering CompTIA's exam 220-801 and the objective tonight is 1.2. So what does that objective cover? Well that objective covers motherboards, their purpose, components, and properties. So we'll talk about what the motherboard is. We'll briefly discuss some of the expansion slots found on the motherboard. I won't go into too much depth on those at this time. Then we will talk about some common components and then a very brief, very brief, by the way, discussion on bus speed. On that, let's go ahead and talk about what the motherboard is. Well, it is the backbone of your computer system. Uh, it provides both the physical and electrical connections for the other peripherals that make up the actual PC. It's what provides the connection between all the parts so that the whole works. Uh, other names for the motherboard are mainboard, system board, MOBO, MB, if you're reading it in literature. I've also heard it called the backboard. Back in the day, also, it was called silicon, which caused some confusion because CPUs were also called silicon. And good thing, good thing that times have changed. Uh, the motherboard contains the BIOS. That is actually the only program that is within or maintained directly by the motherboard. And it is, uh, well, I shouldn't say it is. They tend to be uh, unit specific and the manufacturer of the motherboard is not necessarily the programmer of the BIOS, but the BIOS is programmed for the motherboard. And if you have questions about what the BIOS is, I recommend going back and watching uh, a couple of weeks ago's webinar. So now let's talk about modern sizes of motherboards. And the first one and the one that is most common is the ATX. That is a full size motherboard even though it comes in various sizes. There's also ITX and some of you, if, if you're dealing with um, a little bit older material would be BTX. Now, the ATX, being full size, offers more power capability and more connections, more ability to expand. The size of a standard ATX is 12 inches by 9.6. In the millimeters, that is 305 by 244. Next size down is a mini ATX, that's 11.2 by 8.2 inches or 284 by 208 millimeters. And then we have the micro ATX, which is 9.6 by 9.6, .6, so it's a square, 244 by 244. Then there's the ITX. ITX were made to be more compact. Um, they tend to draw less power. Uh, they have fewer connections but they also produce a whole lot less heat. And for the ITX size, the standard ITX is actually a mini ITX, and that is 170 by 170 millimeters. So it's already much smaller than the smallest ATX. And then there's the nano ITX, which is a 120 by 120. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's a Pico ITX, which is 72 by 100 millimeters, pretty small. If you look at that graphic, uh, those are actually to scale. Um, so that the ATX, if you look at the size difference between the ATX, the mini ATX, and the micro ATX, that's actually scaled. And the ITX are scaled as well and are scaled in relationship to the ATXs. So as you can tell, a PICO ITX is pretty small. Your options for expansion on that are going to be fairly limited. 
Now, why, why would you want to use uh, an ITX mainboard, an ITX motherboard? Well, common uses for them are in things like home theater controllers. And why is that? Well, it's because if you throw a solid state drive in them and the right processor, you don't need a fan. So they run really quiet because they don't produce a lot of heat. So that's why you might want to use an ITX form factor. As a general rule, when I'm building a system, I will use either an ATX or a mini ATX because I'm after the expansion capabilities. So now let's talk briefly about BTX. Um, well, and this is going to be really brief, uh, BTX is no longer relevant. It was being developed by Intel as an alternative to the ATX mainboard. And they halted development of it in 2006 because, well, nobody was interested in it. I do believe they introduced it in about two, so it only lasted five years. I did notice the other day that uh, test out has you memorize a bunch of stuff about BTX, BTX motherboards. Um, you're going to need to memorize them to get through test out, but don't worry about it too much because it's not really relevant. Now, this uh, question about sizes and capabilities of the boards, for those of you who have taken the 801 exam, you know that they will ask you to pick motherboard to fit a custom build. So. Be aware of that and remember what I said, ATX offers more expansion, full power, more connections, and ITX is more compact, less connections, less heat, and remember home theater, okay? That's just a hint for those of you who haven't taken the 801 yet. Okay, now let's talk about expansion slots that are found on motherboards. We're going to start with PCI. PCI stands for Peripheral Component Interconnect. It had a 3333 megahertz clock rate. That means that actually has to kind of deal with speed, okay? The maximum transfer rate was 133 megabytes per second, and it operated on a 32-bit shared bus. Uh, you can still find PCI slots on some main boards, but they're not that common. Uh, they have been superseded. And the first thing that they were superseded with was the PCI-X, which stands for PCI Extended. Uh, the cycle rate or the clock rate on a PCI-X uh, slot could be anywhere from 66 to 533 megahertz. Uh, most common was the 66 megahertz, by the way. But if you happen to get one that was running at 533 megahertz, you could have a max throughput of 1,064 megabytes per second. And that, too, was on a 64-bit shared bus. By the way, that 64-bit means how much, how wide the information flow could go. Uh, and if you notice, 64 is twice as wide. Now, I never really saw too many main boards that came with uh, the PCI-X, and that's because, well, PCIe came along before PCI-X really got uh, going. And PCIe stands for PCI Express. It is high speed, and it's a high speed serial expansion slot. Uh, one of the things that it does is it breaks the bus into lanes, bidirectional lanes. It is full duplex. It can send and receive at the same time. Common sizes of PCI slots are 1 by, 2 by, 4 by, 8 by, and 16 by. 
on the screen there, that bottom one, that bottom kind of orangish colored one, that is a one by PCI E slot. Right above it is a two by, and above that is a 16 by. One of the things that you should notice is the keying, the slot pattern there. You can put a PCIe one by card into a 16 slot, a two slot, a four slot, or an eight slot, and it will work. I don't recommend it because I would hate to waste that much bandwidth, but you can do it. Now, why did they go to PCIe? Well, because you could get up to 31.5 gigabytes worth of bandwidth using a PCI, a version 4, PCIe 16 by slot. Uh, most common use or why they were really kind of developed was for graphics cards. Graphic cards take a lot of uh, power and need to move a lot of information. Well, let me tell you, PCIe was a godsend for the gaming industry. It really, really helped them a lot. So now let's move on to the CNR. That stands for Communication and Network Riser. Uh, these are not that common anymore, but you can still find them. Uh, they were used mainly to add specialized networking, audio, and telephony or telephone capabilities to a PC. They were small, they were compact, because the cards that went into them didn't need a whole lot of power. Even though information might be flowing from them, uh, it didn't need a whole lot. Now, the, uh, is that you probably won't see them too much anymore. Uh, first PC that I built had a CNR that was specifically so I could put my modem into it. So that tells you how old that, that goes. Uh, now let's move on to AGP. AGP is for Accelerated Graphics Port. Uh, this was used only for video cards and it has been, it, it has been replaced by PCIe. Uh, you probably won't come across too many questions that deal with AGP. Just remember that it's accelerated graphics port and it was for video cards only. Okay, so now let's move on to common components. Well, you want to know what? All main boards will have RAM slots. Uh, there could be RAM soldered into the slots if you've got like a Pico or a Nano. ITX mainboard, a lot of those, the RAM is already soldered into the slot, or they can be like this one, where you can add your own RAM. Uh, same goes for CPU sockets. All and back to those smaller ones, some of them will already have a CPU soldered in place. Uh, this one right here, Looks like it uses a ZIF, zero insertion, zero insertion force socket. Um, so this one was probably an EMD board. I didn't look at it too closely before I grabbed the image. Now, most main boards, or almost all main boards, have chipsets. And what chipsets do they have? The most common are the North Bridge and the South Bridge. Although the North Bridge is becoming a scarcity as time marches on, and I'll kind of explain why. The North Bridge, as you'll see, is closer to the RAM and to the CPU, and that's for a reason. The North Bridge was responsible or is responsible for tasks that require the highest performance. And that's usually moving data between the RAM and the CPU. You'll also see that it's closest to that video port, uh, which I do believe, yep, that looks like a PCIe 16 by slot. Uh, so it also shuttles information between that PCIe slot and the CPU. The South Bridge, as you'll see, is a little bit further away. Yeah, and that 
the Southbridge is responsible for interfacing with the CPU and devices that are a little bit slower in speed. That would be your optical drives, your network um, stuff, your PCIe slots other than the video ones, so on and so forth. If it if it could go a little bit slower, it got shoved to the south bridge. Now let's talk about the north bridge a little bit more. Uh, Intel's latest version of stuff, latest version of their CPUs, well, they're building the memory controller and some other stuff right onto the die of the CPU. And what that means is, is they can get rid of the north bridge. They did that because even though the North Bridge can move information quickly, it cannot move information as quickly as the CPU. So the North Bridge had become a bottleneck to Intel's development. So they put the memory controller and some of the cache memory right onto the CPU die and axed that North Bridge. Now the RAM and the video PCIe slots have a direct pipeline to the CPU and it sped things up tremendously. Uh, so if you see a main board that doesn't have that heat sink close to the CPU and the RAM, then you pretty much are assured that's an Intel board and you need to make sure that if you put a CPU in it, it's one that's got the, the memory controllers and whatnot. Now we need to talk about CMOS. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about CMOS. Uh, complementary metal oxide something or other. The CMOS is actually the battery. Uh, the only thing that it's responsible for is keeping the system date and time and for, for ensuring that the user settings the stuff that you guys change in BIOS is maintained. And it does that by supplying trickle power to the actual uh, BIOS chip, to the actual EEPROM. A lot of people, when they, when they talk about BIOS, BIOS losing time, it's not the BIOS that loses time, it's the CMOS that loses time. Uh, and usually that's a sign that your battery is about ready to go dead. Now, a lot of main boards have jumpers. What do jumpers do? Well, jumpers can do things like they can clear the BIOS and default it back to the factory settings. Uh, used to be you would set jumpers to to tell the main board where the video was coming from and so on and so forth. You need to look in your user's manuals for whether or not the board has jumpers and for what the jumpers do. All main boards have a main power connector. On this one, it is on the lower right-hand side. This one looks like it is a 20-pin connector. I didn't count it. A modern standard is either going to be a 20-pin or a 24-pin connector. A lot of power supplies come with a split main power connector. What it'll have is it'll have a 20-pin plug, and attached to it will be a 4-pin plug, so you can make it into a 24-pin plug. All main boards have fan connections. They have at least one fan connection. If you see right up there just to the left of the CPU where it says fan power, you will see a three pin plug there. That is the power for the CPU fan. Um, <clears throat> some main boards will have more fan headers so that your case fans can plug into it and get power from the motherboard <clears throat> as opposed to directly from the power supply. And they do that because there are some settings in some BIOSes where you can adjust the fan speed or you can have the BIOS adjust the case fan speed depending upon temperature sensor settings. All, 
all main boards, all motherboards will have a front panel connector. And you can, this one, it's kind of hard to see. It's in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, there are a set of uh, basically copper pegs that are sitting up. They're usually labeled in really, really small print right next to them for what they do. Uh, this is so that you can get your front USB, your front audio, your power button, uh, the power light, uh, drive activity light, or the hard drive activity light, and the reset button to work on your case. Since the motherboard is manufactured by somebody, uh, usually, other than who manufactured the case, they didn't bother to pre-wire it with standard plugs. Uh, they just came up with a standard for how to do it. Your instruction set on where your main board will tell you where your front panel connector is and what they are and how to wire them. Now let's move on to bus speed really quickly. And what is bus speed? Well, it's the speed at which data can travel within a circuit. It's usually measured in megahertz. Uh, that hertz is, I do believe, a thousand mega is, maybe it's not, eh, but it's measured in megahertz. And usually when somebody talks about the bus speed of a motherboard, they're talking about the front side bus. And that can be up to 800 megahertz. And that's kind of a cheat. And I'll tell you why here in just a moment. So the front side bus is the, the lane between the CPU and the north bridge. The back side bus, you would think would be to the south bridge, but you'd be wrong. It's actually between the CPU and the level two cache memory. Uh, the memory bus, and north bridge to the RAM. Then there is an IDE or ATA bus, and that's be between your, your drives, your hard drives, your optical drives, anything that uses IDE or SATA, and the south bridge. And there's your PCI bus, and that is, of course, PCI to south bridge, and then there's the PCIe bus, which is from the PCIe, or PCI, because it's still just a PCI, but it is E, to the south bridge. Now, why did I say that that 800 megahertz was kind of a cheat? Well, because it's still only running on a 400 megahertz clock cycle. And a clock cycle is a tick up and a tick down. That's one cycle. Well, what they do is they do a uh, double data rate which means that it operates on both the tick up and the tick down. So it operates twice per cycle. So that's how you get up to 800 megahertz because currently it, it, they do have a max of a 400 megahertz front side bus, at least as far as you guys are concerned. Okay. Now, that concludes the information on Objective 1.2 of CompTIA's 220-801 exam. And if you're just curious, there is where I got all the images. Uh, just so you guys know, I thought it was kind of interesting that to find the AGP image, I had to go to Wikipedia Russia to get it. I'm pretty sure I could have found it somewhere else, but that's the one that was easiest to come up with. Thank you for watching this recording.